Good morning, everybody. The Lord be with you. And also with you. My name is Jeremy Troxler, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to our United Methodist Rural Fellowship special presentation and webinar. Um, we'd like to welcome you from wherever you're participating in this today, uh, whether you're here with us in the conference office of the Western North Carolina Conference in Charlotte, um, whether you're at your office desk or at the office in your parsonage, whether you're sitting on your couch with a laptop and a mug of coffee in your hand or whether you're just listening to us while you're studying or doing something else, we're, we're grateful to have you join us from wherever you are today. Um, this webinar is a new way of communicating for many of us. Um, and so we're excited to make use of this new technology. We're, we're hopeful to what we're gonna learn about using it today. Um, and we're grateful for your patience with us as we figure this out and figure out how to do it in the best possible way. Um, we in the United Methodist Rural Fellowship are especially interested in some of the opportunities this technology presents because so many of us knows the distance involved just to go to a meeting so often where th there's very rarely a meeting within a very close drive of where we're serving in rural places. And so we hope that this might be a way to add a sense of connection with one another. The title of today's webinar is The Sacred and Social Life of Young Rural Clergy. Not too long ago, United Methodist Communications published a series of articles that looked at the lives of young clergy, and including one that specifically looked at the unique blessings and challenges of those who are serving in rural settings. And today, we'd like to join in that conversation in different ways. Um, we'd like to reflect a little bit more about some of those same issues by talking together today about a pastor's life beyond Sunday, um, a, a pastor's life beyond their service to their church and congregation, um, what you might call a pastor's social life. Now, to some of us, it might just be refreshing to consider that there is such a creature as a social life. Um, when you're a pastor, uh, that there is life out there. Um, others of us just might find it helpful today to hear one of our colleagues articulate some struggle or challenge that we're very familiar with so that we maybe at least know that we're not crazy uh, and that we're not alone. Um, and maybe, just maybe, there'll be something shared today that will help us as we try in ministry to flourish as whole persons. Um, as God's children, both personally and professionally, um, as we try to experience the abundant life in Christ, both on Sunday and beyond Sunday, in body, mind, and spirit. And so that's our hope today. And to help think through some of these issues, we're blessed to have with us this morning um, three thoughtful and faithful young clergy who in their own lives have known some of the blessings and challenges experienced in serving in a rural place and in seeking to have a sacred social life there. Um, and they've experienced this as a single person, uh, as a spouse, um, and as, as parents. And so I'd like to introduce these three folks to you now, and I'll invite them to come up and stand beside me. The first person I'd like to introduce you to is Jennifer Finley. Now, Jennifer is a 29-year-old book-loving, cat-loving single person who currently lives and serves um, in Ashe County. Uh, she's a commissioned deacon in the annual conference and looks forward to ordination hopefully in a few years. She's originally from Missouri, um, but has come to love life in the South, including in the mountains of Western North Carolina. She's a graduate of Duke Divinity School in May 2008 and uh, moved to Jefferson in August of that year where she's been serving as the Minister of Christian Education um, in a place that's surrounded by both beautiful scenery and extremes of wealth and poverty. Um, Jennifer knows firsthand that the isolation of the mountains creates unique joys and unique blessings as a young adult in ministry and as a single person. And in a few moments, she'll be sharing about that with us. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. We're glad you're with us. The next person I'd like to introduce you to is Mark Conforti. Um, Mark is married to Mary Allen Conforti, and they have three small children uh, who take up a little bit of their time. Um, during his junior and senior years of college, Mark pastored Fort White United Methodist Church, 
which is a small membership rural church in North Florida. He's currently serving in a rural part of Burke County, um, having previously served a two-point charge in Yadkin County. He's a graduate of Duke Divinity School and will soon complete a D-min at Wesley Seminary, and we're grateful to have Mark with us today as well. So Mark, thank you. Our third young clergy person that I get to introduce to you is Nicole Jones. Um, Nicole is originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, and she's a graduate of Appalachian State University and Duke Divinity School. Um, her first experience with the calling to rural ministry actually began when she worked at Jefferson UMC, where Jennifer Finley now works, as Director of Christian Education, and that time fueled some of her passion for ministry in rural places. Um, Nicole ser currently serves in Peachland, North Carolina, as pastor of, of two churches, Gilboa and Peachland UMC, in the Albemarle District. Um, one thing I can tell you about her, as a vegetarian, she enjoys switching up traditional country cooking with a little southern world fusion. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly what that is, but it sounds pretty good. Um, she says she gets her geek fix with the occasional Star Trek Next Generation or Doctor Who episode, which I didn't know still existed. And loves spending quality time outside with her husband, Stephen, uh, and their adorable baby daughter, Eliana, and their two dogs. Um, she feels blessed with each opportunity, she says, to participate in the story of the rural church. So Nicole, thank you for being here with us. You know, the way we're gonna proceed with this webinar this morning is that we've asked each one of these young clergy persons to respond to three questions having to do with the blessings and challenges of a sacred social life in a rural place. Um, and so in a few moments, each one of them will come up here and share out of their own experience and reflection and you'll see on your screen the question that they're responding to. Um, for those of you who may be listening in, watching at home, we'd like to invite you as well to be more than just an audience member, but a participant. Um, because on your screen, you'll find a chat box where you can post some of your own comments and thoughts. And I'd like to invite you, for your colleagues' sake, to share some of your own brief answers to these same questions that our panelists are answering so that we can learn from you as well. Um, so each one of our participants here will answer, the, take turns answering each one of the three questions and then at the end we'll have a little bit of time where we'd like to invite you who are at home to post a question or two that you'd like to hear these folks respond to and we'll, we'll close with that kind of question and answer time. So again, we're grateful to be here and uh, we pray God's blessing upon what we're about to share in. Y'all, as we begin this time, we're going to ask Nicole Jones to begin um, our three panelists by answering this question. What are two or three social graces or blessings or gifts that you or your loved ones have experienced living in the com rural community where you serve? So what are some graces about being where you are? And so we'll invite Nicole to begin. Well, again, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I want to share a little bit from my perspective, and uh, that is of a clergy person who's been in the ministry just over a year now. Uh, when I began ministry and began my appointment at Peachland and Gilboa, I came in four months pregnant. So I was their first pregnant pastor, and in this rural community, they were very excited to tell all the other churches and all the other pastors in the area that their pastor could probably do something they couldn't, which was have a baby. And they were just very thrilled, and they were very warm and gracious in accepting us, even though we were a little bit different, my husband and I, a different clergy couple than maybe is typical for the area. So that was a big first year for us, uh, just getting started, uh, starting a family, having my first appointment, and being in a different area. But it's also been a real blessing. It's been a blessing uh, working from home, which is where the church office is, is within the parsonage. It's been a blessing being able to be incorporated into such a small community uh, where we can take walks around the neighborhood and stop by the post office and get to know everybody there or at Bob's, the gas station, where there's an older gentleman who's about 80 years old who still comes out and does full service at the gas station and getting to know the life and the history and the story of a people in a rural community. So that's been a, a wonderful blessing, is just getting to dive into the story and having uh, been incorporated into a community which allows us to be part of their story. 
It's also been nice having a flexible schedule that with rural ministry, you never get bored. I'm not one that could just sit in a cubicle and um, do paperwork day in and day out. Uh, with rural ministry, I could start the morning in a field picking turnips that we can go out and sell for our ministry fund for youth or that we can give to hungry members of the community. Later, I might end up at a hospital at a bedside of a dying parishioner, or I might show up at a Bible study, or just driving around town and introducing myself to some of the folks in the neighborhood. So having that flexibility and having the spontaneity of rural ministry is exciting and it's wonderful. Um, and I appreciate having the opportunity to serve in a place like that. I feel like there's a lot of gifts in the small rural church, which the broader United Methodist Church is in need of. I'd like to say thank you again uh, for the well, for the first time, I didn't say it first yet. So thank you for letting me be a part of this great opportunity. Thank you to Jeremy for the invitation, and thank you to my friend Heather Kilborn for encouraging me to be a part of this. There are two particular social graces that I've experienced in the settings where I've been fortunate to serve. One is a natural understanding that family is important. I've noticed that in the places where I've served, the people who live in these rural communities live there on purpose many times because that's where their families are, that's where their family homestead is, that's where their grandma was raised, and they couldn't imagine living anywhere else. And so when we were living in rural Yadkin County uh, a few years ago, both my mother and my wife's mother were diagnosed with cancer right about the same time. Both were in need of surgery and follow-up treatment at Duke. As you might imagine, my wife and I were both wanting to be there with our mothers, to be with our broader families, and the congregations very naturally gave us the space to do that. They understand that family is important, and they wanted us to make family a priority as well. So we'll always be thankful for that gift. Of course, another social grace is the gift of hospitality. And my family and I have received hospitality in so many ways in different settings, whether it's been uh, a basket full of fresh vegetables brought to the doorstep of the parsonage, or whether it's being welcomed into a family member's home for a fellowship meal. There's one particular family I'll always remember. It was when I was a college student serving at Fort White United Methodist Church in North Florida. I would go to eat at congregation members' homes probably four or five times a week. And there's this one family, Glenn and Helen Bailey. They were in their late 70s. They lost both of their adult children uh, when they were in their 30s. And life had been really hard for the Baileys. They showed me in their dining room where their son Robert would always sit for their family meals. And when I would eat with the Baileys, we always sat in the kitchen at a small, very modest table. But on Easter Sunday, they wanted to welcome me to sit at the dining room table, and I'll never forget how both Mr. and Mrs. Bailey insisted that I sit in their son Robert's chair, and apparently no one had sat in that chair since he had died. And so I'll always be grateful for their warmth and their hospitality. I am pleased to be here, um, and as Jeremy introduced earlier, um, I have a unique perspective as a single young adult in a rural area, um, and a rural area that is unique um, in our state, I think. Ash County is um, both a rural area, but also an area that um, has lots of second, second home residents, lots of people who have moved to the area, so there's a vibrant community there of people who are not necessarily native, as well as those who have remained in the area with their family. Um, and one of the things that I have come to love about the area is the community life. Um, there is a rich tradition and heritage, um, community concerts, choral concerts, um, arts, um, lots of things to get involved with, and I have loved doing that and loved being able to go th to those things and be known, um, to be present in those places and not be alone because 
I know that people know me, whether they're congregation members or those I have met out in the community through church or just out on my own. That has been one wonderful grace so that I, I don't feel as though, uh, as someone who moved to the south from the Midwest, that I am a stranger. I am never felt like a stranger in that place, and that has been a great blessing. Um, as I think several of us were talking before, we have found that with each blessing we thought of, we also thought of a flip side, so we'll be sharing that in a little bit. So each one of these, I, I can think of blessings and those things that are challenging. Um, I think one of those other blessings I have found in, in our area in particular is the beauty, the natural beauty that surrounds Ash County with the New River and the mountains. Um, and given the flexibility of uh, my schedule as a Christian educator has meant that I've had some time to hike up Mount Jefferson or to go enjoy the New River. Um, in fact, uh, one of the best meetings I've ever had, we had a meeting with two adults who helped me with the youth group, and we went kayaking on the New River. Um, we got stuff done, but we had a great time doing it. Um, that has certainly been a blessing. Yo, thank you to our, our panelists for their answers to our first question. I, I think it's important to start off with talking about what is good and what's blessed about living in these places because I, I think it's easy for us sometimes to, to skip past these things or to take them for granted. And so um, I think it's important sometimes just to acknowledge all that's good socially about living in the places where we are. Um, but we also know that there are real challenges to being in a rural place, and, and many of you have experienced those firsthand. But we're going to invite our panelists to reflect on some of these experiences now. And so our second question is, what social hardships have you um, and or your loved ones faced as a young pastor or family living in your rural community. And we'd again like to invite those of you who may be watching or listening in at home to share some of your own thoughts in response to this question. What social hardships have you and or your loved ones faced as a young pastor or family living in a rural place? As I said, I think several of us have found that there are flip sides to the joys. Um, there are challenges of being a young person in a rural setting. Um, in my case, being a young single person in a rural setting. Um, of course, there are the church members who think that they need to find me a spouse. Um, that, that seems to have not been too much of a challenge in Ashe County. Um, but some of the things I have found challenging have been um, that because it's such a tight-knit community, there are wonderful opportunities for community engagement, but I'm always representing the church. Um, even as a staff member, I'm not the, the pastor of the church, but even as a staff member, um, as we've done more collaborative efforts with our fellow United Methodist churches in the county, it has meant that I am always the one representing the church, whether I'm attending a book club or a concert on my, in my free time. Um, along with that, I found that those things I tend to enjoy most, reading, um, working with the, the library in the county, um, attending concerts, um, those things in our county tend to be attended by those who are older. Um, there's not a lot of a younger demographic. Um, and while normally I, wouldn't, I would not mind that, it has meant that I'm often doing things alone or by myself. Um, sometimes that gets old. Um, sometimes you just like to go to a concert with somebody else um, or n somebody else who's not a church member um, where you're in that role as well. Um, one of the other things I found in our particular area is that Everything of a, of a large size is about two hours away, so the closest target is about two hours away. Um, and what that has meant is that I've had to drive to find opportunities. Um, many of the opportunities for social engagement in my area are held during the day um, for retirees and those who don't work. Um, so, for example, to find a book club that I could enjoy, I, I have driven to Boone, which is about 40 minutes away. Um, as opposed to being able to do something in our area. There is a blessing in that, but that is also a challenge. Um, and, and I think particularly in my area, the isolation can be challenging um, and helping people understand that it's all right for me to travel other places to, to find those opportunities. I could also speak to the challenges that go along with being isolated from the perspective, though, of, of a husband and father. We also 
when we were living in Yadkin County especially, needed to drive a long distance in order to get to a grocery store, doctor's office, preschool, shopping. And it's extraordinarily challenging with small children who are on nap schedules, who need snacks at certain times, who might need a change of diaper at certain times, and there creates this incredibly thick layer of uh, frustration um, and difficulty when having to travel in order to do things that we would like to be just right down the road. Uh, so that's definitely something that's been frustrating and hard for me and my wife. And what's also hard for me is watching my spouse have a hard time. I feel like God called me into this ministry. And when my wife and I got married, she had a pretty good sense of what she was signing up for. Uh, but of course, we never know what life is going to be like. And so it's hard for me to watch her um, experience some of the struggles that we've had to endure together. I'm very proud of her, though, and I think she does a great job with it, and I love her for her support of me. I think another challenge that we've experienced is not mixing in well with our surrounding culture. And something we've struggled with is feeling elitist. We don't want to be elitist. We don't want to be, but sometimes we feel that way because of our perspectives on, say, education or what we like to do with our free time. Um, and so we've really struggled with that because we don't want our tastes or perspectives to be an indictment on the community in which we're serving. So we continue to struggle with this, um, and we continue to pray for God's grace with it. I can echo a lot of the challenges that my colleagues just mentioned. Uh, three things, time, distance, and location. So managing time has been a difficulty, trying to balance that time between being a mother, being a wife, being a pastor of one church, and being a pastor of another church, and then also uh, caring for myself along the way. So that's been a real challenge, and uh, also figuring out What's work and what's home life? Uh, having an office that's within the parsonage, suddenly uh, there are books and papers on the kitchen table, or there are toys on top of my desk, and there's the book of worship floating around in the nursery. There's all sorts of things that start blending, and life starts blending. So just trying to figure out a way to say, okay, I'm home now, I'm really home, my attention is completely on my family, or I'm at work now. And uh, you're going to need to take our daughter, Stephen, over to the next room while I meet for a pastoral visit. Uh, distance is another issue. Uh, not quite as isolated as Jennifer is up in Jefferson, two hours, but we do have a good long trek to get anywhere. Uh, any meetings are usually an hour away or two hours away. Uh, also, it's a distance to get to the gym. It's about 30 minutes to get to a gym, which takes a huge chunk of time. Um, there's uh, every meeting that's out of town and gym, social life, all those things are a good trek. As well as our parents, uh, having family that are far away, several hours drive uh, while having a young child can be a challenge. Uh, and the location, we are right next to the church as I'm sure a lot of you all are too. And so it's interesting having the church basketball goal in our driveway and the kids playing there. And then um, the Baptist church is about maybe 10 feet from our church. So we had this huge yard, uh, including the parsonage. So it's a blessing, like we've mentioned it being a blessing and a challenging, uh, hearing all the children laugh and play outside. And every time there's a church event, you're right there. But every time there's a church event, you're right there. So uh, that's, been, that's been an interesting negotiation as we go along. People know when we've left our porch light on, if we've left the trash out, when we get home, why we aren't home yet. Oh, we were calling it 930 because we figured you're still up, your light's still on. So that's been really interesting in the small community. But again, the blessing is that we know there's people that are looking out for us and taking care of us too. There's not a lot of resources. So again, social outlets can be difficult. Um, just trying to figure out what you're going to do or how you can slip off for a, a date night or meet with other young clergy. Uh, so that's something that we're still trying to figure out uh, as we go along in this appointment.
Well, thank, thanks to the three of you for those two questions. And uh, some of the folks on chat have added to and echoed a lot of what you've been saying in terms of what does it mean to have a social life in a community where maybe your own um, political views might be very different, your own kind of the culture you're from might be very different. Um, you know, other folks have talked about even just finding other young people to, to spend time with, especially outside of the church. Things like child care, uh, date night, you know, taking 45 minutes to get to the restaurant or wherever you want to go if you, if you get to have a date night at all. Um, so, so the next question, the last of the three we'll pose, is, is an important one. Um, and, and basically it boils down to, so what helps? Um, the, the question is put this way, what recommendations surrounding a pastor's, pastor's personal life would you have for other young clergy just beginning to serve in a rural place? Um, another way of putting it, or what are some of the things that you found helpful to you in establishing this? Um, and and what, what do you feel is necessary for you to be able to flourish where you are? Um, again, we welcome our panelists to share about this and you're invited to share your answers with one another through our chat feature. One of the main things I can say is to remember that this is a calling, not a job. That it's easy to think that there are a certain set number of hours or holidays that you need to take off, but remembering that I'm being called to this particular community, I'm being called to a particular people, and to live my life among them has been a helpful thing for myself. Uh, also realizing that private public distinction might not always happen. Uh, that's been something I've had to negotiate this past year and uh, several years before when I was in ministry before becoming a pastor. But uh, looking more at the blessings of that rather than being frustrated by that private public life blending together all the time. Uh, there's little things I think you can find in your community that can help for me uh, going to the gym even if it's not every week. Uh, if I just manage to get there two or three times a month. That's two or three times a month where I have time that's away and it's outside of my uh, appointed area. Uh, also, there's a library baby time in the next town over, so we'll take our daughter over there just to be at the library, which is a different sphere and a different area and different people to talk with. Connecting with other clergy has been such a blessing for me the last year or so. Uh, having different groups that I've connected with and uh, even if it's a meaning that we have to drive a bit to get together, uh, it's been helpful just to drive together and to talk to maybe carpool and have opportunities to discuss the challenges and blessings of the rural church uh, in, an, in a forum where we all understand what's going on with each other. And then getting out of town. Um, once in a while, get out of town and take a vacation, and that's been really helpful for us, even if it's not consistently, if it's not every week or um, every month but every once in a while, just learning to take some time off and go off somewhere for a little bit. And then uh, Jeremy mentioned in the introduction that I'm a vegetarian. I am maybe the only vegetarian in my entire county. I'm not sure. But finding what you love and what makes you you and the person that God created you to be and sticking with that and not being ashamed of it and not being elitist about it either, but and just showing other folks what you can do with collards that maybe they've never done with collards before or turnips and saying, you know, that's okay if y'all are going to watch the Braves game, I'm going to go watch Doctor Who or whatever it might be, but realizing that God made you for the person you are and just celebrating that um, and enjoying that God has called you to be in a place that's maybe different from uh, how you were raised or what you're usually like and that you can learn from each other. I appreciate everything that Nicole just shared with us and just to build upon it from my perspective I found it helpful to mark things on my calendar and think of it in the same way as I would a district meeting. I know that if I ever get a note from the district superintendent's office saying there is a meeting at this day at this time I write it down on my calendar and nothing gets in its way. I think going to the gym, having date night, time with children, getting out of town for a vacation, whatever it might be that's also very personal, 
ought to have the same level um, of importance on our calendar. So I always try to think of those things together. The other big thing that I would want to mention is I think we all need a cadre of supporters. And I think we all need both mentors and peers. If we need coaches or therapists or personal trainers, that's great too. And we need to seek those people out to give us the support that we need. I think something we all share in common though, we all need those mentors that help us and peers as well. And I think they serve in different ways. I still keep in touch with my mentors, whether it's a visit or email or Facebook. When I was uh, serving in East Bend, once a month, I would gather with three other United Methodist clergy that serve nearby. We would get together for lunch and just catch up and talk and laugh. Um, it was an electionary group, although those are great too, but this was really just for the purpose of um, letting each other know, hey, I'm here, I'm with you in ministry. Those peers are so important uh, and the mentors are too. I'm certainly an advocate for both. I think I would echo much of what has been said already. Um, I guess in my mind it boils down to don't ignore the resources that are available in your community, but also don't ignore or apologize for seeking resources outside the community. Um, one of the things that has been a blessing to me, um, as well as Mark said, is to find resources and peer groups outside of the area. Um, one of my greatest blessings is a group of two or about three of us from Duke that graduated together. Um, one of us is serving in North Carolina. Um, another friend is serving in the Free Methodist Church in California, and someone else is in the middle of Texas, in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we meet on Skype every couple of weeks for a book discussion. We covenant together to read a book in theology or biblical studies. Um, and that's part of our time together is truly discussing that and keeping abreast with theology. But a larger part of that is just keeping up with each other, um, touching base. So when one of us is, is discerning whether to change ministry appointments, we talk about that. Um, or when someone's going through a hard time, we talk about that. And there is a freedom in having people in vastly different geographic areas where there's no constraints about who might hear what in your annual conference. Um, that has certainly been a blessing. Um, I'd also say don't apologize for taking the time to travel to other events, even if they're required meetings. I've had to have a couple conversations with both of the senior pastors I've served with. Um, for, I think, some older clergy, um, it, it's not as important. They may see those as burdens. Um, and draining. Whereas I see traveling to a meeting for young adult clergy, even if it's uh, a required meeting, as life-giving because there's relationships that I'm that I'm building. Um, retreats, required meetings, um, anything that gets you out of town sometimes, even required district meetings can be a blessing. And just I would say don't allow the negative um, attitudes of some other clergy to, to negate those blessings that you might find in those. Um, and I guess the last thing I would echo about finding time for exercise and going to the gym, um, take what you can get. Um, I have recently taken, found a love of, of running and jogging. Um, it's been a great blessing. It can be my time just between me and, and nothing interferes with that, except when I get to church on Sunday morning and someone says, I saw you jogging down the road. Um, and I just had to learn that that's just, that's part of the compromise of being in the area I'm in. But, um, I think that's, that's, I would echo much of what we've said. Friends, thank each one of you. In, in the time that we'd have to have left here today, we, we'd like to ask some of you to, if you have any questions, um, if you have any thoughts, you would invite our panelists to respond to. And um, what I'd like to do, I'd like to ask if our panelists would come up here and stand with me. Um, and, and to give our friends on chat a little bit of time to think about that, I, I wonder, is there any question that any of you here um, would have or, or would ask of, of these folks that have joined us today that you're curious to, to hear their thoughts about? Mm -hmm. 
I, I have one, I, I guess I'll begin, is, um, you know, we talked about both the blessings and the struggles of, you know, being in a real place, and I, I, I wonder to what degree were some of those things a surprise to you? Like, to what degree do you feel you were prepared for that, um, either in the process of, of your seminary education or, or just in talking with other clergy? Do you have anything that you'd share on that? Mark, you want to begin? <laughs> Whether you liked it or not? Yeah. When I was in campus ministry, I always liked telling the college students that there are different levels of life where you just don't know what it's like until you do it. Um, I feel like going away to college is one of those experiences. You just don't know what it's like to live in that dorm and to eat that food and to wake up and do your own life. You just don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be married until you're married. You don't know what it's like to have children until you have children. Jeremy, I don't think anything could have prepared me <laughs> for what we experienced <laughs> when we went to Yatkin County. Both the blessings and the challenges. The mentor that I mentioned before, specifically uh, that I had in mind, Jody, the senior pastor I worked with for five years. And Jody uh, continues to love to tell stories about the first appointment that he served after serving as an associate. And he has all these really funny stories, and I used to listen to them, and I thought, oh, that's funny. Well, that's from a bygone era, um, and, well, he's not that old, but it's from a long time ago, and that'll never happen to me, and, well, my goodness, I, I found myself just experiencing so many things that, that he experienced, which, again, reaffirms the need, I believe, for mentors to stay in relationship with us throughout our lives in ministry. I think the short answer is uh, no. <laughs> um, I think you know many of us have compiled lists in our heads of the things they did not teach us in seminary. Um, and I think this may fall under the category of you simply can't be fully prepared until you really experience it. Um, and because one of the things I've realized through ministry in Jefferson is that Ministry is so contextual. Um, it matters where you are. Um, it matters in my case that we have both affluent part-time residents who spend part of the year in Florida and a higher than average poverty rate. Those things matter to how I do ministry. Um, and I'm not sure until I got there and really got into the community that I could understand that. I, I felt blessed with the opportunity to serve a little bit in ministry prior to becoming a, an appointed pastor in the Methodist system. So. Uh, being able to serve at a church and then having field education opportunities certainly helps. But again, there's nothing that prepares you for your new, next context. And I imagine that's the same for every church and every appointment, that there will always be something new. And, and that part of that's also the blessing, the exciting part of being in ministry and being in our appointment system. I'll ask a, a couple of questions that, that folks on chat have asked, and the first one, uh, the first one is a question about dating, um, and, and I'll expand it to whether you're single or married, you know, in terms of uh, either with dating, you know, if you're a single person who's a pastoral leader, uh, or if, if you're a married person who needs to spend time with your spouse, and, and so I guess what, what, what's a thought or two that's been helpful to you all as you think about those things? Thank you, Mark. Sure. I like to date my wife, and only my wife. <laughs> Very good. Very good, Mark. the record. But something that I've grown to learn is um, I can't be afraid to spend money. You know, our, our income is modest, and we can only do so much. And, um, yeah, I really don't think I'm a cheapskate. It's just I want to try to save money here so I could spend it over here. So a lot of times my wife and I have said, oh, well, we can't afford a babysitter. We can't afford to go out. We can't afford the gas <laughs> to drive to Winston-Salem or wherever. Um, but I've grown to realize we just need to just forget about those things. And if it's going to cost a little bit of money to hire a babysitter, then just do it and be done with it. I know that um, a lot of other pastors have benefited from having church folks come and babysit kids so that they can go out. We've been a little bit hesitant to that because that means we have to clean the parsonage 
and we feel pressure about the parsonage having to look a certain way before the church members could come. It's not that we didn't trust the church members, it's just another layer of hassle in order to have fun. We don't want hassle to have fun, we want fun to be fun. I have a confession to make, and that is my daughter is 10 months old, and my husband and I have yet to go on date night. So it, I imagine some of y'all might be in the same boat, but not having um, family or babysitters around, and then the issue of driving somewhere to find a place to go on a date and those kind of things. But what we do do instead is we often incorporate life like today. Um, we're meeting out of town and we're in Charlotte, so we'll probably go out and have lunch together or go to the grocery store, which doesn't sound very exciting or romantic, but I love grocery stores. <laughs> so you don't know, huh? But um, just incorporating it into the life. If we have a retreat or a seminar somewhere else, um, I'm very fortunate my husband is a stay-at-home father. So we just try to incorporate it into our life and hope that eventually, um, when we can save up and stuff, we'll have an opportunity to do more of those date night kind of things. Well, I suppose if we're making confessions, um, I have served in Jefferson for three and a half years. I have not gone on a date. Um, that's just reality, um, where I am and, and my personality. I, what has helped me is a couple of things. One, to remember that God created us in God's image, that we are all whole and complete persons, and that you do not have to be married to, or even be dating to um, be a whole and complete person in ministry. Or and, and, and one blessing has been that I have been able to narrate that to my congregation at some times, and, and have found wonderful friendships, as close to friendships as can be possible in the church, with other people who are old enough to be my parents but have been lifelong single. Um, and those, those relationships have been certainly have been blessings. Um, the other thing that has helped me is to remember that and to know that I think God calls us to particular times and places as seasons of life and to know that this season will not last forever and that this is where God has put me and blessed me at this time. And, and those two things have, have helped. Thank, thank you all. Well, I'll, I'll ask one last question uh, of you, and then we'll draw our time to a close. Um, what is one thing the United Methodist Church could do um, to encourage support, better encourage support, um, young rural clergy surrounding some of these issues? I'll stand here until somebody <laughs> steps forward to take the microphone. Thank you, Jennifer. I'll just briefly say something very practical that I would love to remind those who, um, well, who make new districts, who put us in REOM groups, who do geographical kind of things, that um, not all of the mountains are together, um, and that rural areas sometimes have different travel patterns. So it is easier for me, for example, to get to Winston-Salem from Jefferson than it is to get to Asheville or Lake Junaluska. Um, and those things make a big difference. Um, so I just you know, put that out there for people in leadership um, to be mindful of, of how context and geography make a difference in both traveling and, and how we interact with each other. This is such an important question, and I do think that this question could be fleshed out differently in our annual conference as opposed to, say, the Rocky Mountain Conference. Uh, and so context is key. Though I do think that we need to uh, keep in mind needs of families, um, including um, when small children are in need of, say, daycare or preschool. Um, it would be nice to be appointed to a community that could provide such opportunities, uh, because otherwise the pastor and spouse uh, might end up feeling so worried and concerned about the situation that um, he or she might not feel as free to be in ministry, as free to engage in the life of the community. Uh, so I really do think that it's so important uh, in the appointment process to take into account the needs of families. I think another thing too is just to build in uh, a good dosage of flexibility and patience and understanding so that we can build in time to take care of our own souls, to take care of our bodies um, and to take care of our families. 
And along with the child care, just thinking about job situation too. I'm in a county where it's a, difficult to find job opportunities, so that's been difficult for my spouse who's done all sorts of odd jobs here and there um, just to help out with our income. But uh, it's also been a blessing that even while he's unemployed now, he's able to stay home with our daughter. So again, there's those blessings and challenges that seem to be right together. I think one of the biggest things um, is for folks who have been in ministry for a, lot, a while or a long time, to renew that joy that you first had when you came into ministry, to renew that love that you have of Christ and Christ's church, and to share that with younger clergy so that we see 20 years down the road that you still love this and that you are still thriving and that there's joy. And I've been very blessed to have mentors in my life that laugh that have joy, that say, uh, I've just had this great pastoral visit, or I'm really mourning a loss of a church member because I care for them. And so hearing that, that you're still loving being part of this church story, I think that's what it's going to take to help revitalize the church, is people who are joyful about serving God and serving God where they are, no matter where that may be, and finding the joys and the blessings in that particular context. Friends, again, we'd, we'd like to express our appreciation to uh, our three uh, young rural clergy panelists and for what they've been willing to share today in putting themselves forward. So could maybe our folks here express that appreciation? If you're at home, you can do your own thing, too. So thank, thank you all. Um, friends, just a, a few final uh, words and announcements. Um, you know, several of you have commented that this has been a, a, a good thing for you and, and you're grateful to be able to participate in it. We're, we're hoping to do this again. We, we talked about putting something together uh, maybe in the new year uh, or in the spring um, that might continue this conversation or that might even talk about some of the issues that are going to surround general conference coming up. Um, but do look for that. If this has been valuable to you, if you know of other people that you think this would be valuable to, help us to share that and, and to expand that as a way of connecting. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is, is an announcement. One of you had a question about what it means in an area where so many young people have moved away to college and have never come back to be a young leader in a community. Um, and next week, the North Carolina Rural Economic Development Center is going to be hosting their annual Rural Partners Forum in Raleigh. And basically, the topic for that focuses on engaging young leadership in rural places. Um, so if you're interested in joining with other people who are thinking about those things or going, please do think about checking out their website and considering that. Um, because I think that may be a unique thing that those of us who are young rural clergy can do to strengthen not only the church but the community is by investing in young people who can become leaders there. Um, again, we're grateful to all of you for participating from wherever you are. We want to offer our special gratitude um, to the United Methodist Rural Fellowship that has made this possible. Um, and to its president, Randy Wall, for drawing us together and having the vision to make this happen. We want to deeply thank the, the folks here um, with the Western North Carolina Conference office, Steve James, Ed Walk, Skylar Nimmons, my new friend Chris, for actually making this work. Uh, if we had been left to do this on our own, you'd be looking at a blank screen right <laughs> now. So, um, so again, thank you to everyone. Uh, we wish you every blessing, and if, if you'd receive now, through a screen or in person this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. We go in peace.